So our topic is the kingdom of God on earth, God's solution to this world's problems. And we're going to take a little bit of a different approach to maybe the uh, typical public lecture on the kingdom of God. Because initially, what we're going to talk about is this world's problems. And uh, I think you'd probably agree that, you know, this world has a few problems. You only have to, uh, you know, look at the news or open the newspaper these days to, to see about this problems of this world. But what we want to talk about are some of the big problems. Uh, some of the uh, maybe high-level problems that are facing the earth that maybe have a bit of a, uh, a time element to them. In other words, if these problems aren't resolved, it's, it's going to result in some fairly cataclysmic things happening in the uh, not-too-distant future. And then at the end of the talk, uh, we'll tie it back to the kingdom of God and see how uh, the kingdom of God addresses some of the high-level uh, big-hitter problems of this world. Okay, so a uh, little uh, audience participation here. Uh, does anyone have an idea what this is a graph of? You know, maybe we've got some engineers in the audience. Population. Right, this is a, a graph uh, of the world's population. So uh, don't pay too much attention to uh, you know, the, these dates down here. Uh, obviously, uh, these dates, the further back we go, are projected and it may not be very accurate. Uh, but what we see here on the, uh, the vertical axis here is the world's population in billions. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll uh, start from uh, around the time of Christ. You know, the world's population was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 200 million. So that's uh, only about 2,000 years ago. Uh, at about uh, 1,000 uh, B.C., or A.D., the world's population had really not grown that much. It was only about 250 million. And then you see there's uh, a couple uh, down ticks here. Does anyone have an idea what those uh, down ticks might be associated with? The Black Death, right, the Black Plague. So there, there was actually a couple times where the Earth's population went in reverse. But what we notice uh, in more recent times is that the Earth's uh, population is exploding. And uh, this is an issue uh, that uh, doesn't get as much attention as you think it would uh, because many consider it to basically be being, uh, being a ticking time bomb. That uh, you know, basically the earth is headed towards a major disaster uh, due to overpopulation. Now, um, we recently passed uh, the 7 billion mark. I believe that was in the year uh, 2011. So fairly recently, just a couple years ago, the Earth went uh, flying past uh, 7 billion population. Now, if we look at, uh, you know, basically this is a graph of, you know, when the Earth's population went from 1 billion to 2 billion to 3 billion to 4 billion to 5 billion. And, um, you know, here we are in 2011 uh, when the Earth's population hit 7 billion. And, and what we notice is, is that the growth of population has really uh, been accelerating. So, for example, in uh, uh, the year 1800, the Earth's population at 1 billion. It took 127 years, uh, in 1927, for the Earth's population to hit 2 billion. Uh, and then, uh, amazingly, uh, things have been uh, rapidly accelerating. Just uh, back in 1960, which, you know, I mean, I think some of us might even have been alive back in 1960, believe it or not. Uh, you know, the population of the Earth was only 3 billion. And, and here we are uh, in 2011 at uh, 7 billion. So things have really been rapidly accelerating. These are the number of years it took to reach the next uh, population milestone. What we notice is, is that the population is starting to slow. Uh, these are all projections, but actually it's projected that it'll be 14 years in the year 2025 when the Earth will reach 8 billion. And it'll take 18 years for the Earth uh, to reach 9 billion. And then in 2083, uh, the Earth will reach a population of 10 billion. Now, where is all this population coming from? Because, you know, some countries, like, for example, the countries of Europe up here, uh, actually have very little population growth. Um, and, 
in some countries, for example, like Germany, there's actually negative population growth where things are going in reverse. Interestingly, the, the population growth, and I, I don't know how clear this is showing up, but uh, for example, this uh, green color here, kind of green-yellow color, uh, means the population in that given country is growing one and a half to two and a half percent annually. And uh, these red and orange colors, the population is growing even more rapidly, two and a half to three and a half percent annually. Uh, what do we notice about where the population is growing most rapidly? And we also have, uh, you know, kind of the population growth in this 18-year period from 1990 to 2008. You know, where the most rapid population growth has been. Does, it, does, does anyone notice any common themes as far as where the population is is growing most rapidly? Are these, are these the, uh, necessarily the wealthiest countries in the world where the population is growing? No. Quite to the contrary. I mean, actually, where the population is growing most rapidly is in the poorest countries of the earth. This, um, countries that are along the equator here in Africa, South and Central America, and over in Asia. So we might say that the countries that are least able to handle uh, serious issues are the ones that are experiencing the most rapid population growth. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of overpopulation. And you know, overpopulation is very simply the population exceeding the carrying capacity of the area or environment. You know, so uh, uh, an area or environment, we might even say the earth, has a certain carrying capacity. It can carry so much population. Now, does anyone have any ideas on what the carrying capacity of the earth is estimated as by, uh, by experts that study these types of things? Anyone want to throw out a guess? Four billion. Four billion? It's a good one. Any other guesses out there? Four billion is a pretty good guess. Um, here is the estimate of the Earth's carrying capacity by a, a variety of experts, and this uh, information all comes from the United Nations. The average estimate of the Earth's carrying capacity is 10 billion people. Okay. Unfortunately, when you, when you don't have a, a very high accuracy on your estimate, there ends up being a, a big range. So whoever said 4 billion, that was a good guess, because that's actually the low end of the range, and 16 billion is the high end of the range. Okay, now, what causes um, the, this uh, range to exist? Well. The low end of the range is, is more accurate if our resources are depleted and or consumption increases. And I read a really interesting fact preparing for this talk. If the entire world lived like we live in the United States, so with that level of consumption, we would need three Earths to support that level of consumption. Okay, so. Uh, basically, the Earth's carrying capacity is 4 billion. If we're all consuming, like we do here in our uh, capitalistic uh, United States, or if we have a depletion of resources. Um, however, there is this high-end estimate. Um, if, for example, there's further advances in technology uh, that, that enhance medicine and agriculture, that some people estimate that uh, the Earth could actually carry as many as 16 billion people. Now, of course, the disturbing thing about this is that we're already inside this range. You know, the Earth is already at 7 billion people. Uh, it's headed towards 10 billion. So we're already inside this range where the Earth uh, is reaching its maximum carrying capacity. Now, what happens if the carrying capacity of the Earth is exceeded? And, and this has happened in nature uh, many times, um, in, uh, not so much in the human population, but in the animal population, uh, where uh, a predator is eliminated uh, in a certain area. There was actually uh, in the reindeer population uh, earlier in this century, 
there was a huge explosion in population due to uh, elimination of some uh, predators and uh, there was an overpopulation. And what ends up happening is there's a, a rapid depletion of resources. So you have, you have too many uh, consumers uh, and basically the food and the water starts getting rapidly depleted. And then sure enough, there ends up being conflict over the remaining resources. So, you know, there's fewer resources, there's too many consumers, and you end up with conflict. Now, uh, a unique aspect of, of the human experience is, of course, we have to have politics when we have human beings. So, uh, in the case of uh, human overpopulation, uh, there would be political unrest, overcrowding, famine, dehydration, and eventually the inevitable happens. There has to be a population decline. Uh, you know, basically there is a, uh, a die-off, if you will, and that's what happens in, in the animal kingdom. There was a huge die-off of uh, the reindeer population and other animal species that have run into this problem of uh, overpopulation. And, of course, in the case of humans, we had this extra way of getting rid of people, which is called war, but, you know, also disease and starvation. Okay, now, you know, th this is basically the situation that the world is headed to. You know, we are headed down the path of overpopulation, and these are the types of things um, we should be looking to see if things go on as they are. Now, interestingly, um, there's some fairly well-known latter-day verses, which if we read them carefully, um, we see that there's some fairly distressing and serious things going on uh, in the latter times. In Luke 21, verses 24 through 26, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations. And that's really what we would expect in a situation of overpopulation. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and we know that the sea and the waves here represent the masses of people. You know, this is not really the, the governments, if you will. The governments are up here uh, when we see uh, signs in the sun, moon, and stars. But this is really the, the masses of people which are distressed. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven, that is the governments, shall be shaken. And also, also over in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book of life. And you know, it's interesting these words here, that there shall be a time of trouble such as there uh, never was, since there was a nation. Now, you know, this earth has been through a lot of troubling times, right? I mean, there's been world wars, you know, there's been the Black Plague, you know, there's been some fairly cataclysmic events. But what this verse here in Daniel chapter 1, verse 12, uh, Daniel 12, verse 1 is telling us is that there is something coming that's worse than anything the earth has ever experienced before. And, you know, if we look at this overpopulation issue, um, you know, I think you probably agree that, you know, if the earth reaches a point of population saturation, you know, there, there could be horrible things happen. You know, significant conflict, war, famine, uh, depopulation, um, massive amounts of, of death and destruction. Okay, now let's talk about a related issue. Now this is one of the, the wild cards in overpopulation, which is resource depletion. Now, um, <clears throat> there's basically two types of resources that the Earth has. And, you know, you probably read about some of this in, uh, in the news recently. There's what are called non-renewable resources, which are things like fossil fuels, uh, metals, phosphate. And then there's something called renewable resources. These are things that renew naturally. Things like farmland, fish, 
uh, wildlife, water, wood. So um, basically resource depletion is when one of two things or both are happening. One is that we're running out of renewable resources. Well, you might say that, you know, this is guaranteed to happen, right? I mean, if they're not renewable, you know, sooner or later they're going to run out. And, and sure enough, um, we are eventually going to run out of things like fossil fuels, metals, and phosphates. Of course, the answer to that is we have to replace these non-renewable resources with renewable substitutes, such as wind, solar, biofuel energy, or recycling. Uh, the problem is that these forms of renewable substitutes cannot keep up with the, uh, the amount of uh, usage uh, of non-renewable resources, especially in the area of fossil fuels. Um, many studies have been done that have shown that you know, there's just not enough windmills, there's not enough uh, solar panels, uh, there's not enough agricultural production to produce biofuels that can make up for the pace that we're burning through fossil fuels. And of course the other aspect of renewable resource um, uh, resource depletion is depleting renewable resources faster than they can be replenished. Now <clears throat> these are just some examples of resource depletion. I, I was a little bit surprised when I uh, was doing some research for this talk uh, at some of the time frames involved. Uh, one non-renewable resource uh, is a chemical known as phosphate and this is used in fertilizers. And uh, a little known um, secret uh, outside of, that is really not that well known outside of the agricultural community is that the Earth's farmland is producing food at an abnormally high rate uh, due to fertilization. So uh, the, the big fertilizers that are used are nitrogen and especially phosphate. And these fertilizers are being poured into the Earth, not just in North America, but in farmland all over the Earth. And um, it's really only through use of these fertilizers that are kind of replenishing the nutrients in the ground that the earth can support, you know, the, the 7, 10 billion type population figure. Um, and much of that fertilizer is phosphate. And, and that's a, something that's mined out of the ground. There's a lot of phosphate in the, in the United States. There's uh, uh, phosphate uh, mines in Brazil. Um, it is estimated, however, that all those phosphate reserves will be used up uh, by the end of this century. So by 2100, there's no more phosphate to use as fertilizer. And uh, there's really no good substitute, so, uh, a substitute that occurs in, in uh, high enough uh, quantities. So you, you see what's going to happen if this world is left to itself is that this population is growing on a curve like this and all of a sudden we're going to run into some uh, very sudden resource depletion events where all of a sudden the Earth's carrying capacity is going to go from you know maybe eight nine billion down to six or seven billion and uh, you know these things are coming and, and there's there's basically not a whole lot we can do about it uh, or at least man can do uh, on his own. Uh, there's this other thing we've been told about called peak oil, which is, uh, you know, been pushed, the, the can has been kicked down the road a little bit on that due to all the uh, recent tar sands and uh, natural gas uh, fracking technologies that have been lost. But essentially, a peak oil is the high point of oil production. That's, that's all it is. So it's when we reach a crescendo of world oil production, after which um, the quantities are steadily decreasing and hence uh, the world oil extraction is steadily increasing and this of course is when oil prices will start to go back up. And then lastly, perhaps most startlingly, are fresh, clean water supplies. So if Christ may, remains away, you might want to hang on to that real estate in the Great Lakes region. Uh, <clears throat> by 2050, two-thirds of the world's population will not have adequate water. Now that's a startling 
fat. You know, with something here in Michigan that we just take for granted, right? We turn on the tap and, you know, I don't know about you guys, but we're, we're not big water conservationists at home. You know, we just let it flow. But two-thirds of the world's population by 2050, which is really not that far away, will not have adequate water. So this world is really headed uh, to a situation where uh, the, the, you know, the world is being bent right now, and it's headed to a situation where it's going to break. Let's talk a little bit on the consumption side. So, you know, two things can lower that carrying capacity of the earth. One is uh, reduce resources. The other is increased consumption. Now, this is a really interesting graph. Uh, this breaks the world into ten um, uh, equally uh, numbered groups and uh, by income. And you can see here that the top 10% of uh, the richest people in the world consume 59% of the world's resources. Okay? So the, the top 10% consume 59%. Um, <clears throat> the, the bottom 1%, uh, you know, the 10% the, the, the most poorest people in the world, are only consuming half a percent of the world's resources. So this is a, a little bit disturbing because, you know, we had talked about <clears throat> a lot of the population growth uh, is in the poor countries. Well, the problem is, is if even if you curtail that population growth in the world's poorest countries, they're not the ones doing all the consuming. You know, we in North America are the ones doing all the consuming in the other developed economies in the world. So let's talk a little bit about capitalism and consumption. Capitalism depends on continuous growth. That's the only way capitalism works, is you always have to grow. You have to grow um, the economy. Uh, mature capitalist countries' populations tend to slower decline. Um, for example, J Germany, Japan have basically negative growth rates. The United States has a very low growth rate. So what, how do they do it? How do countries like Japan and Germany, for example, survive as capitalistic countries when their growth rate is zero or even negative? Well, what they do is they export. Both Germany and Japan are uh, very strong uh, exporting countries. And, and what they do to maintain their standard of living is they maintain their growth by exporting capitalism and their goods to emerging markets. You know, we've heard of the BRIC countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China. So the way that these capitalistic countries keep growing is basically turn other countries into capitalistic countries and turn those countries into markets for their goods. Now, what is the problem with that model? More and more regions of the country, or of the world, become high consumers. You know, more and more countries like Brazil, India, China, uh, start to become, uh, you know, moving towards the high end of the consumption scale. So you can see we got a lot of things that are all converging at once here. We got uh, exponentially growing population. Uh, we got serious resource issues, and on top of that, we have a growth towards increased consumption. Um, and this consumption is unequal. Uh, just one quote from this uh, ecologist from Duke University. Everywhere I went, for, and he's talking about uh, different African, uh, small African nations he was visiting. Everywhere I went, foreign commercial interests were exploiting resources after signing contracts with the autocratic government. Prodigious logs, four and five feet in diameter, were coming out of the virgin forest. Oil and natural gas were being exported from the coastal region. Offshore fishing rights had been sold to foreign interests, and exploration for oil and minerals was underway in the interior. So a lot of these countries that are not, you know, being developed as markets for goods, uh, the poorest countries are basically being exploited. You know, a lot of times we read in the Old Testament about, you know, persecution of the poor and how the poor were uh, exploited for the sake of making the rich richer. And sometimes we read those words and we're like, you know, how on earth could we ever 
sign up to something like that. You know, that's horrible. You know, we would never be guilty of persecuting the poor in this way. And yet at a national level, that's exactly what's happening. At a national level, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. You know, that's what's happening uh, at a, a national global level. So let's read some verses from Revelation 18 because, you know, this idea of consumption and increased consumption is something that the Bible talks about is another sign of the end days. Uh, in Revelation 18, starting at verse 10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Now the interesting thing about these verses, and not only is it talking about a, a situation of incredible consumption, but it's also talking about like a core economic power of Babylon and then kind of peripheral nations that were made rich by her, that are kind of standing off to the side and kind of bemoaning, you know, Babylon's demise. So we don't want to get into exactly, you know, who Babylon specifically might be in this context, but it's interesting that, you know, you, you, you think about these core capitalistic countries that are kind of tempting these other growing co economies with capitalism to try to keep their own standard of living going. And, you know, you could really see how that concept uh, fits in with these verses. Okay, let's talk about our last big world problem before we start talking about the kingdom of God, specifically. And um, <clears throat> I have to uh, give credit where credit is due. Fortunately, I, I work with a, um, a climate scientist, uh, Dr. Tim Wellington, and he... Uh, he let me steal some of his material for this talk, so um, I'm certainly not an expert in global warming, but Dr. Tim is, so we can, uh, we can take his word for it anyway. And he uh, shared with me some of his material. So we've talked about overpopulation, we've talked about resource depletion, we've talked about consumption increase. Let's talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, to the Earth's environment. Okay, so... Um, are, is anyone familiar with plant hardiness zones? Do we have any gardeners in the audience? <clears throat> anyone ever planted any, uh, you know, forsythias or rhododendrons or azaleas? You it know. Depends on how, where on the equator you are. So exactly. The warmer things are in the south, <coughs> can grow different, more in different things. Right. So here we are in southeast Michigan. Back in 1990, southeast Michigan was in plant hardiness zone 5. So this means you only could plant certain types of plants in Michigan if you expected them to live through the winter. And things like azaleas and some of those beautiful plants we see down south were not on the list. So, you know, if you planted uh, azaleas or rhododendrons in Michigan, you kind of did so at your own risk because they probably wouldn't make it through the winter. Here we are in 2006, 16 years later, and uh, Southeast Michigan is now in plant hardiness zone 6, which means uh, there are some species of plants you can now plant in Michigan that you couldn't before because uh, the winters are more mild. And you can see the general trend that these plant hardiness zones uh, are, are moving uh, northward uh, due to the fact that winters are indeed getting milder. Um, we also have a Lake Mendota, and you might ask, why on earth are we talking about Lake Mendota in Minnesota? Well, Lake Mendota happens to be a lake where they've been keeping very careful maximum ice thickness records since 1860, or even a bit before 1860. So we have someone to thank in Minnesota for, you know, fastidiously taking ice th thickness records. And what you'll notice here is that... Um, the ice, or this is the total duration of ice, I should say, um, has been, uh, the total duration of ice on Lake Mendota uh, has been trending down 
uh, from 1860 through 2000. So, you know, the basic uh, message here is that, you know, whether people want to admit it or not, the Earth's climate is getting warmer. Uh, this is another uh, really uh, neat picture that uh, Tim had. Um, has anyone ever been to Glacier National Park out in Montana? Yeah? Okay. Uh, this is uh, one of the famous glaciers there, Grinnell Glacier, in Glacier National Park in 1940. This is that same glacier today. And, you know, this is very typical of glaciers around the world, that there's significant ice loss, um, significant, significant melt that's not being replaced and being replaced. This is showing uh, Arctic sea ice, and you can see that, um, you know, this red... Um, line was uh, a sea ice extent uh, some time ago and then this is the current extent of sea ice and you can see that there's been significant loss of sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, this is showing a global temperature rise over the last several decades and it correlates very well with uh, this greenhouse gas carbon dioxide so as the con atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is going up which is this green line, um, we also see that the global average temperature is going up, um, which is this red line. And this is just another look at the parts per million CO2 captured on the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Okay, so <clears throat> we, are, we are basically headed towards a one degree um, global temperature rise uh, over uh, what is considered normal. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but actually environmentalists tell us that that's about as much as the earth can absorb without significant uh, ecological damage. And what the predictions are is that actually the earth is headed by the end of the century to about a two degree on average temperature rise. And that is somewhat unavoidable. We're pumping so much CO2 uh, into the atmosphere that, that basically even if we all stop, stop driving cars today and you know, stop using fossil fuels today, um, it would be very difficult to avoid um, that level of temperature rise in the, in the coming centuries now um, or the coming decades. Uh, one of the things that people feel is connected uh, with global warming are extreme weather events, uh, droughts, wildfires, storms, floods. Um, it's, it's difficult to say whether we have more extreme weather events now than let's say we did a hundred years ago um, because records were not kept uh, that well uh, but most uh, climate scientists agree that we are seeing uh, an increase in extreme weather events due to this uh, climate change. Okay, just a few quotes. Uh, this was a report just released by the National Academy of Sciences uh, that was uh, on CNN.com just last week. Um, some really interesting things. The long, slow process of climate change may trigger surprise shifts that could threaten human communities in years or decades, researchers from the National Academy of Sciences warned Tuesday. In a 200-page report, the scientists called for an early warning system that will watch bellwethers like Midwest aquifers, Antarctic ice sheets, and a tropical coral reefs for signs that a tipping point is coming. Accelerated environmental changes can already be seen in the loss of Arctic sea ice and the bigger wildfires since 1980, the authors said. They further go on to say there's a high risk of increased extinctions of land and sea life, resource depletion, and the di disappearance of Arctic ice cap in summers within the century. So that basically means that all the ice in the Arctic would melt. There's a high risk of that. There's a moderate risk of increased heat waves, a decline in oxygen, uh, ocean oxygen levels, and rapid changes to ecosystems that would threaten food and water supplies. So while the Earth's population is growing exponentially, we have global warming going on that is going to start eroding the Earth's resources. And a probably known 
low but unknown risk that warmer rising seas could undermine the ice sheet that covers western Antarctica, raising average sea levels far more and more quickly than the roughly one meter or three feet they're now projected to increase by 2100. Okay, and the high-end estimates are that if this uh, ice sheet um, lets go that currently covers Antarctica, sea levels could rise as much as 20 feet by 2100. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here that enjoys going to Florida every once in a while. You know, that would basically mean the entire state of Florida is underwater if sea levels rise 20 feet you know, up to uh, the northern panhandle area of Florida. So, you know, we're really talking significant changes here. And look at the most at-risk countries. Um, the most at-risk countries to be affected by global warming are the ones where the population is growing the fastest. Uh, these, these countries in the center area of Africa and Asia and um, Central and South America, Bangladesh, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, Haiti, Sudan, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Cambodia, the Philippines, Ethiopia. And the common themes of why these countries are so susceptible are their susceptibility to floods, um, agricultural disruption, rapid consumption growth. In some of these countries, like the Philippines, there's actually growing economies that are going to increase consumption, declining fish populations, weak governments, and poverty. Uh, just a quote from this one uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences. Continuing to burn fossil fuels at today's rates would be an act of extraordinary winning intergenerational injustice, Hansen and his colleagues concluded. In other words, you know, we're, we're completely dooming future generations by, you know, the behaviors of the current generation. And, of course, we have a verse in Revelations 11. Verse 18, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. You know, and, and the implication here is clearly that there are people that are destroying the earth. You know, and that is part of the problem that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to solve. The list goes on. We've, we've touched on maybe four major categories of, of major world problems, overpopulation, resource depletion, consumption increase, global warming. Um, there's others as well. Uh, lost biodiversity due to species extinction, uh, nitrogen runoff. Has anyone been to Lake Erie lately and seen all the, the green goo and algae that's covering a good chunk of Lake Erie? Just talk to someone that owns a cottage on Turkey Point. They're not too happy. Uh, that's from fertilizer runoff, nitrogen runoff, that has uh, changed the uh, pH of the, the water in Lake Erie. Ocean acidification, pollution, ozone layer depletion, overfishing, deforestation. So what is the conclusion? You know, I, I don't want to be a, a, a doomsdayer, uh, but the earth, left alone, is in serious trouble. You know, and this isn't just, you know, tree huggers and, you know, people with a political agenda. This is, you know, many, uh, you know, credible sources in many different areas basically saying that the earth left unto itself is headed for a major cataclysm uh, due to overpopulation, uh, resource depletion, consumption increase, environmental issues, pollution, uh, corruption. Uh, we haven't talked too much about uh, government corruption, but you know there could be a whole other talk here on government corruption and the economic, economic side of the equation, uh, that the earth is sitting on very fragile uh, economic foundation right now. So, what was Walt Disney's solution to this? Has anyone seen Wally? Simon, do you know what Walt Disney's solution was to resource depletion, overpopulation, and consumption increase? Was that? Space. Right. Everyone was sent off into space on the huge uh, interstellar cruise ships 
So, you know, they, they built all these big uh, spaceships that looked like cruise ships, and everyone was loaded onto these things and sent off for a permanent cruise off into space uh, because, you know, the Earth was completely depleted, you know, full of pollution and garbage, no more resources. So that was Walt Disney's solution. Now, unfortunately, Walt Disney will probably be three feet underwater in the not-too-distant future, so we probably shouldn't listen too much to what they have to say. They probably are going to have bigger concerns like trying to relocate to higher ground. Um, but God has a solution uh, for this world's problems. You know, the Bible speaks repeatedly over and over about the fact that, you know, the meek will inherit the earth. You know, blessed are the meek, very basic verse of Matthew 5, verse 5. They shall inherit the earth. Uh, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. You know, so some, some very fundamental uh, basic verses. Uh, in Matthew 6, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And just some basic review points on the kingdom of God. It's a frequent theme in Jesus' teaching. Um, you know, Jesus frequently uh, told the people he was teaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, repeated by the apostles, the apostles uh, picked up this uh, theme of a uh, teaching about the kingdom of God. Uh, it was also a key feature of the promises to the patriarchs when God took Abraham up to that mountain and told him to look to the north, to the south, to the east and to the west, and all the land that he sees, uh, he would inherit forever. So, you know, the kingdom of God um, is a big theme uh, in the Bible. Um, it replaces the kingdoms of men. Um, it fills the whole earth. Uh, Jerusalem is the capital. Uh, Jesus the king, the saints help Jesus rule, and there will be a mortal population. So the Bible is full of teachings on the kingdom of God. The question is, with the earth in such rough shape, do we really want to inherit the earth forever? You know, with the earth with all its resources depleted, um, you, know, you know, significant contamination due to pollution, you know, wouldn't it be better to take Walt Disney's solution and just kind of blast off into space on, you know, floating cruise ships uh, for, for the rest of eternity? You know, do we want to inhabit the earth forever in its really destroyed state? Well, the interesting thing, uh, brothers and sisters and friends, is that the kingdom of God will, is more than, than simply just a, a change and uh, a dispensation. The kingdom of God will actually fix and reverse the damage that man has done uh, to the earth. Um, the kingdom of God is essentially coming just in time before the earth will be so significantly damaged uh, by man that uh, the job of reclaiming it uh, would be much greater. Uh, the earth in its current state is a ticking time bomb headed for a major cataclysm. Now, I know that, you know, in the comfort of the Royal Oak Community Library, you know, with all those good-looking desserts on the back table and, you know, lots of nice warm jackets to keep us, you know, warm and comfy in this cold weather, you know, it, sometimes here in North America, it's a little bit hard to really accept this, isn't it? But it is true. The earth is a ticking time bomb. And in not too much more time, the earth left to itself would be going through major cataclysms. As we've said, overpopulation, resource depletion, consumption increase, global warming, a myriad of other environmental issues, corruption, inequality, and things we haven't even had time to talk about, like financial instability. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the kingdom will fix uh, the physical problems on the earth. We read in 2 Peter chapter 3 uh, that when the kingdom comes, there will be a cleansing process. And we don't know exactly what that will be, 
But the, the language in the Bible is, is very much akin uh, to a purge that will happen to this earth when Jesus comes back. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens, speaking of the, the political power, shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, uh, speaking of the, the, uh, the earth itself and the people that inhabit it, shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are in, therein shall be burned up. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, we, we spend a lot of our time as Christadelphians explaining why these verses do not mean that the earth will be destroyed and, and kind of burned up and done away with forever. But these verses do speak of a purification process, a process by which um, the earth will be refined with fire uh, and will come out the other end a new place. Um, you know, one thing that maybe we don't like to talk about too much, you know, but the Bible is pretty clear that this overpopulation issue that we've been talking about, well, there will be a bit of a correction uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Um, when uh, the Gogian invader uh, comes down into Israel and invades the land of Israel, uh, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Go a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And it will take the house of Israel seven months uh, to bury uh, the Gogian invader that invaded them that they may cleanse the land. You know, maybe it's not super comfortable to talk about, but that's a lot of dead people. It takes seven months to bury all those people. And we also know in Zechariah that um, there would be two-thirds of the nation of, um, of Israel would perish in those uh, tumult of, of the last days surrounding the return of Christ. And we don't know how far and wide this this last day conflict will be as far as spreading over all the earth. But the Bible is pretty clear um, that there will be a culling, if you will, of this uh, overpopulation that is um, currently headed for disaster on the earth. Uh, the other thing that the Bible is pretty clear about is that uh, after the earth comes out of this purging process, uh, the earth will become much more productive than it currently is. Um, in Psalm 67, verse 6, Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless us. Uh, in Ezekiel 36, And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced, and are inhabited. So not only will we have a reduction in the population of the earth, but the productivity of the earth and the resources of the earth will increase. Consumption will also be reduced in the kingdom. Now this is something that uh, maybe is uh, a little bit less easy to prove. But we have this verse in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, that they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So these uh, consuming ways that result in hurting the earth and destroying the earth will be discontinued. You know, those will no longer exist in the kingdom, this, this, this rampant consumption. In Micah 4, verses 3 through 4, He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hook. So the weapons of war will be turned into agricultural implements. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. So, you know, could this verse indicate that heaven forbid we won't have a capitalist
capitalist economy and the kingdom, but will we return to more of an agricultural, agrarian lifestyle? One that is not based on continuous growth of consumption and you know, buying all those things that we don't really need and you know, just accumulating more and more wealth. You know, there definitely seems to be overtones here that the economy will be different. It will be more agricultural, more agrarian, and not based on growing consumption. Corrupt governments will be replaced. Um, we read in Isaiah 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and rebuke many people. So, you know, these governments that are exploiting poor countries, that are uh, encouraging consumption, um, that are part of the problem, uh, will be replaced. And the cause of the poor will be prioritized. You know, the, uh, uh, a lot of times we, um, you know, think that, well, you know, there's really nothing that we can do to help the poor. And, and you know, maybe there is very little we can do to help the poor. But the systems at a national level that result in uh, inequality and, and uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer will be replaced by the Lord Jesus Christ who places a priority on judging the poor and saving the children of the needy and delivering the needy and the poor also. And he shall spare the poor and the, poor and the needy and save the souls of the needy. Um, he shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence and, shall, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon and they of the city shall flourish like, flourish like grass of the earth. So where, where do we fit into this picture? Um, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to learn about God's purpose. His purpose to fill the earth with His glory through His kingdom. We need to repent and be baptized. We need to fill our lamps with oil. There's a great parable in Matthew 25 about uh, ten virgins who were awaiting the bridegroom, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and five were foolish and did not replenish their lamp with oil or uh, the word of God, and five were wise and did replenish their lamp with oil. And then finally, we need to await the soon coming of the Lord in faith and holiness. Okay, so the last question we want to answer tonight is when. When will this kingdom come? You know, uh, I want to know so I can make sure I'm ready when this kingdom comes. The answer is we don't know. We don't know when this kingdom will come. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. So even though we don't know the exact day and hour. One thing is for sure, and this isn't even talking about the, the many prophecies we being, see being fulfilled before our eyes every day, but simply what's happening to the earth right now, the path that the earth is headed down. Um, it's headed for disaster. So um, if the kingdom of God is coming to reverse many of the problems that man has called, caused, basically destroying the home that he lives in, uh, the answer is not very far away. You know, the kingdom cannot be that far away because man is headed down a path of destroying the earth. So in conclusion, let's heed the advice of the Lord Jesus. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Watch.